think it is fitting that we the end this year with Psalms. I've done quite a few messages this year and finished series, several series, long series. Systematic Theology, 194. All the Psalms and all the, the parables in the Bible, 194 classes also, I believe. The book of Luke, the book of Matthew, these are all studies that we've finished. And yet they're never finished, really. There's always something there that you didn't see the first time or the second time or the third time, fourth time, fifth time. Now let's go to a, a psalm. A psalm that ought to be precious to everyone that knows the Lord. It's a psalm of David. <clears throat> Look at David's life. He was a fragile vessel, so to speak. He was a cracked pot. He was a, uh, a man of God, that, a man that loved God. But he had weaknesses. Weaknesses. David did love God because of his transgressions and because of his sins and because of murder. Murder. The Bible doesn't say thou shall not kill. The Bible says thou shall not murder. And he did. But God used that man, that fragile vessel, to glorify himself with. David, in many ways, is a type of us. Who do you know that is worthy of salvation? Who do you know that can just walk up into heaven and say, Hi, God, move over and let me sit down? Not one. Not one. We have esteemed leaders in the world, religious leaders, I'm going to do a series on the origin of the races and the sons of Noah, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, and what contributions they've made in the world and how that God used them. And that's one of my goals. Whether the Lord lets me do it or not, I do not know. If I live, if I, the creek don't rise, I will try to do that and give it study. If you would like to read a good book on those, it's Noah's Three Sons by Arthur Custance in the Doorway Papers. You will learn something. David was a, a man <clears throat> that was very spiritual. Now, this, the Shemites, or the sons of Shem, were, Shem means name or monument. And it is a, they would be the spiritual leaders of the world, uh, so to speak. The book of Genesis 9 and 27 says that later on that the uh, uh, Japhethites would take the place of Shem. And they are right now in the church age. The Shemites, the Jews, have fallen away from the administration of the, of the kingdom of God. The Japhethites took it over. The Hamites have made every discovery and every uh, invention, primary invention in the world. The Japhethites have done very little and the Shemites have done almost nothing. The 
the Hamites have done all of the work. They've spread all over the world. And Japheth followed in their pathways and their trails and manipulated and uh, used them. By the way, only the son of Ham, Canaan, was the servant of all. But in many ways, Ham has been a servant to all mankind. His, his children hit the race of Ham. They never were spiritual leaders, but they led out in technology and inventions. The Japhethites improved those inventions and used them to build up the world. The Shemites seem to be, have always been out of balance. Now you have to realize the sons of Shem are also the Arabs. We call the three great religions, monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. <laughs> the only thing about Islam is not a monotheistic religion, no matter what they say. They are pagans, and they are idolaters. Christian dumb is not Christianity. Judaism left the calling of God when they crucified the Messiah King that God had sent to them. And they were set aside for a while. The Gentile church has conversed the world. Now let's go back to a time when Israel was actually one of the leaders, or the leader of spirituality. David was uh, an unusual man. He was spiritual, very spiritual. He is the greatest songwriter in the history of mankind. I don't think anybody with good sense would say that David wasn't the greatest songwriter and singer in the history. He was a rock star, the star of the Bible. The rock star of the Bible. And here is one of his great messages. <clears throat> I don't think anyone has ever topped Psalm 23. And all of these messages were sung. Now David teaches us uh, the blessedness of forgiveness and the blessedness of trusting in God. How blessed, how happy is he whose transgression is forgiven. He's who uh, wandering and astrays are forgiven whose sin is covered. Because we have sin. We have sin. I uh, <clears throat> grew up in a charismatic church. Pentecostal holiness church. That's exactly Pentecostal holiness church. Now they believed that after they were saved and baptized that they did not, they, they had the ability not to sin anymore. And sometimes I think hyper-Calvinism is almost a twin sister to it. David was a, uh, a preacher that was acquainted with uh, war, the physical world. He was a he was a mental giant of his day. What we need to do is tr try to balance our lives between material, spiritual, and the physical world. David in many ways did that. And yet he was a sinner. How blessed and happy is he whose transgressions has chatha is uh, forgiven. Whose sin is covered. Not by you, but by God. 
How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. Like Hebrews 10 and verse 17. And in whose spirit there is no guile, deceit, or room. You know what? When you're born again, your spirit no longer sins. Your spirit doesn't. Because that's the spirit of God. In whose spirit there is no room. This, it says in, in Genesis, the third chapter, that the serpent had become a room, had become deceitful. He wasn't created that way. Your spirit does not sin when you've been born again. That spirit is of God. Your soul can. Your body can. But the spirit does not. I would sit there and listen to these people and it would just make me cringe when I was a young man because I was a sinner. And I heard them say I haven't sinned for 20 and 30 and 40 years. Very proud of it. And yet right there they were lying because they had. They're lying. Our idea of sin is what we create as our boundaries. It is not God's idea of sin. When I kept silent about my sin, my body just wasted away. Through my groanings all day long. This is a saved man. This saved man was groaning all day long until he asked the Lord to forgive him and renew his heart. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality, my strength was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. And now David says, think about that for a while. That's what Selah means. Think about that for a while now. I acknowledge my sin to you. And my iniquity I did not hide. I haven't lied to you, Lord. <clears throat> Try to hide it. You know, sometimes men call our shortcomings before us. I remember the man that, that protected the child molesters and the torturers and the, uh, Gerald Oldfield, Esquire. Just... I never saw a man relish in, in, in lies like that man and deceit as a man that was supposedly upholding the truth. I called him on the carpet one time in the courthouse down here on Truxton Avenue. I told him, I said, you are in a lot of trouble with God. You will pay for what you've done. He looked at my attorney and he said, tell your client that he can't say that to me. And I looked at him, I said, wait till God calls your name. My attorney said, you can't say that to him, you know. I said, well, it's the truth. He cringed. Wait till God calls his name. Wait till God calls the name Terry Dennis, who covered it up with him also. They worked in conjunction. Sinners. Terrible sinners. Covering up crimes. They may as well have been politicians. How blessed is the man who does not impute iniquity. In whose spirit there is no deceit, no guile, no arum, no deceitfulness, no theft, no lust. When I kept silent about my sin, my body just withered away. Through my groanings all day long for day and night, your hand was heavy upon me and my life, my vitality was drained away with the fever heat of summer. And like I said, he said, rest for a little while. He said, I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. And I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, not to men, but to the Lord. I, I I was 
preaching a message in Fish Lake Valley, and there was a man there, 88 years old, that was a Roman Catholic all his life. I preach the gospel, people. I really preach the gospel. And at the end of that message, that man, you can listen to it. It was called God's eternal purpose. You can listen to him. He said, I never heard anything like this in my life. I've gone to go to church all my life. I never heard anything like this before in my life. This is thrilling. And I asked him several weeks later, what do you think about this? He said, I know one thing. I don't have to confess my sins to God, to a man, a priest anymore. I can talk to God. When you confess your sins to a priest, it doesn't do you one's lick of good what at all. Just man. Men don't forgive your sins. God does. Men have no right to hear your sins or to forgive you of sins. I acknowledge my sin to you and all in my iniquity I did not hide. I said I will confess my transgression to the Lord. And you have forgiven the guilt of my sin. No longer there. You know, in false religious systems, there's always guilt. There is. There's always guilt. A Muslim always is fearing, unless he dies in killing somebody in jihad for the name of Allah, he's going to have to go to hell for a while. The Roman Catholics never know whether they're going to get to God or not, and then when they die, they're going to have to pray some priest to get them out of purgatory, which is the invention of that hellish system. Job witnesses never know what they've done enough. The Mormons, well, they're trying to catch up with God. The Buddhists are trying to go into nirvana, in other words, into the bliss of nothingness when they die they'll just go away and cease being they won't have to be reincarnated into a flea or a lice or a fly or some elephant or tiger or something or a crocodile or a worm maggot therefore let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found Surely in the flood of great waters they shall not reach him. Boy, in the flood of great waters, I mean, that's when life is crashing down, when death is coming upon you, they will not be able to reach God. You are my hiding place. You have preserved me from trouble. Now that's really something there. You have preserved me from trouble. Well, the results of trouble. We've all been through a lot of trouble in this world, I think. Maybe some of you people are exceptions to that rule and have just lived a sweet, wonderful life and never had a child that went astray or a wife that went astray or a husband that went astray or your best friend turn on you. Or somebody fire you from a job that you're trying to do the best and uh, all of the unrighteous things that can happen. You have surrounded me with songs of deliverance. Songs of deliverance. Look at that. And actually it's uh, shouts, praises of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way in which you should go. I will count you with my eye upon you. Not far away, but with my eye upon you. You know, God is a magnificent God. God is all-knowing, omnipresent, and omnipotent, all-powerful. Now, do you know what that means? That means wherever anyone is that calls upon God in the whole world, that God's there immediately at your beckoning call. 
I'm going to counsel you with my eye upon you that he can see us all, the all-seeing eye. He will see us wherever we are. Do not be as the horse or the mule which have no understanding, whose trappings include bit and bridle to hold them in check. Otherwise, it would not come near you. Well, I tell you what, some, some horses, the way they're treated, they wouldn't want to come near the masters. Vicious people. I used to train wild Mustangs. I'm going to tell you something, they're wild. And they're afraid of you. They're wild animals. But I'll tell you what a horse is. It is a herd animal. A horse doesn't like being alone. They like to be with other horses. And if you take all the other horses away from them, they're going to be want to be with somebody. My old stepdad, Dale Remling, used to say to me, he said, son, go put the Indian sign on him. Take that horse away from all the other horses and, and make friends with him and, and uh, teach him. Teach him. Teach him how to lead. Teach him I'm not going to try to kill him. That I'm not a lion or a bear or something. That I want to be his friend. Otherwise you're going to wrangle him until he's afraid of you. But if you can make him a part of you, it's a whole lot better. Not by force, but by love and by trust. A few years ago, nearly 10 years ago, I guess now, we had a little dog come out in the yard. That's a, that was the weirdest looking thing. I thought he was a wiener dog, a dash hound. Turned out he was, he was a corgi and Rottweiler. Like black and tan, like a Rottweiler, and short leg like a corgi. The gangs here had uh, used him to, to teach their pit bulls how to fight. And he was just riddled. His rears are all ripped up. I call him Spanky Bruce. Dog was afraid, wasn't he, Marilyn? I trapped him out here in a pen. It took me several weeks before I could pet him. He didn't like Marilyn at all for a long time. He'd growl at her if she'd come around. But I finally got him where he, where he trusted me. He was full of holes. You couldn't put your finger where he did not have a fang mark where he had been fought. His little ears were shredded. He's still out there now. You ought to hear him holler and, and cry when I come in the yard. He just can't stand it. He just like that, wanting me to come pay attention to him. I taught him with love and caress. He didn't have to go kill a chicken or a rabbit or something to eat. He was wild out here for a while with other pit bulls they had dumped. All of them were killed except for him and I trapped him. They were dangerous. They were brute animals at that time. The soul of that little animal out there is so sweet now. Because I loved him. I wanted to show him kindness. <clears throat> Otherwise, they won't come near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked. Boy, that's going to last for eternity, isn't it? Many are the sorrows of the wicked. Man. Man. For all eternity, why, Cain and Abel lived way back over here in this period of time right there. And when Abel, di or when Abel died, he went to be with God. 
But when Cain died, he's in sorrows, and he sure will be in sorrows. And it's just getting started, people. Just getting started. Hell's a long time. Many are the sorrows of the wicked. But he who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness shall surround him. Literally, just baptize him. Totally immersed in, he's immersed in loving kindness. Surrounded in it. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones. Now, we're not righteous by our own deeds, but they're white righteous because of the blood of Jesus Christ. How do you get righteous by the blood of Jesus Christ? It's imputed to you. All of you out there, or wherever you are. The righteousness of Christ is imputed to you when you ask God to forgive you and say that I believe in your son that you sent for me, that I believe that he died on the cross of Calvary. I believe he was put in the grave, and I believe you raised him from the dead. He died for my sins, was raised for my justification. And then you're saved forevermore. Many are the sorrows of the wicked. But he who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness shall surround him. And be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones. And shout for joy, all you who are, are upright in the heart. Shout for joy. Shout for joy. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise Jehovah. You who have asked the Lord to save your soul and forgive you of your sins are righteous. You are saints. The word saint is not of earth. That's what it means, not of earth. Hagios. Not that alpha negative on the front and gay, not of earth. When you're born the first time in this world, you're born of the earth. You're born of the sin of your father in you. The blood of Adam flows in your veins. The curse of Adam death and the curse of sin is upon you but when you're born from above the spirit of rebellion that is in you now is replaced with the spirit of God and that spirit of God goes with you to your grave to you that breathe your last and then it goes with your spirit soul to God and that body goes in the grave and rests for the resurrection the Anastasia be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones. Rejoice for your names is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Shout for joy, all you who are upright in heart. Thank you, Father, for this message. This message of forgiveness and love and kindness and loving kindness. Thank you that you gave your son to die for us that we might have eternal life. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for repentance that you grant unto us and the faith you give us. Yes, we're saved by grace and we're kept by grace and, and we have faith that comes from you also. It doesn't come from us. Thank you for all these things and thank you for your son that we might have fellowship with you, that we might have his righteousness upon us and we're clothed in it. Father, forgive me where I fail you. In Jesus' name we pray. Touch the hearts of people out there all over the world with your word, with your forgiveness and your love. And I pray for those that are sick, for Donnie and Howard and in the hospital with the coronavirus and his family that they won't be plagued with this China plague. 